Hi everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about how to be prepared for an IRS audit. Let me give you some background on this and then I'll go over what you need to do to be prepared. First of all, uh, there are approximately 138 million tax returns filed every year and approximately 1 to 2 percent of them uh, are audited by the IRS. Now there's a lot of different kinds of audits that they can do, but there's two main ones that we want to be concerned with tonight. One of them is an audit through the mail, and the other one is an audit in person. Now, each audit has its advantage and advantages and disadvantages. You don't get a choice of which one you're going to have. The IRS will send you a letter saying that your tax return is being examined, which is basically an audit. If they ask you to send receipts in the mail or certain types of documents in the mail to prove deductions on your return, that's an audit by mail. And basically, you won't be sitting down with anybody. You'll just be sending the stuff to somebody to take a look at your receipts. In an in-person audit, they will ask you to call to make an appointment to meet with them in person, either at the IRS office or if it's a business, they will come out to your office. Now, each audit, like I said, has its advantages and its disadvantages. With the good thing about a mail audit is that they usually only look at the year that they're talking about, and if you send all the receipts and everything, they're basically making sure that you have all your books and records in place. Uh, the disadvantage of a mail audit is that you don't get to sit down and talk to somebody face-to-face, -face and you're not there to explain what's going on, so all they have is the receipts that you send them, and if you don't put good documentation in place, it may be hard for them to follow what you send to them. The, the uh, good thing about an in-person audit is that you do get to sit down with somebody, but the disadvantage of an in-person audit is that they usually end up digging a little deeper, and they ask you a lot more questions, and they could end up auditing up to three years on your tax return. They usually start with uh, the tax return from two years ago, and if they don't like what they see on that return, then they expand the audit to the year before that year and the year after that year. So in-person audits are usually a little more severe than audits by the mail. But anyway, let me go over what it is they're looking for in an audit and how what you need to do to be prepared. Now, when you get audited, they, they're looking for two possible things. One, they're making sure that you reported all the income on your tax return correctly. And two, they want to make sure that all the deductions that you claimed on your tax return can be substantiated. In other words, that they're correct and accurate. So the first thing is, let's go over the income. A lot of the times they'll audit a return where somebody has a business, and they're going to want to look for unreported income. So what they're going to do is they're going to ask you for bank statements because what they're going to do is they're going to add up all the deposits that go through your bank account for the year. And then they're going to compare that with the income that you reported on the tax return. So if the income reported on the tax return is less than the deposits, then you'd have to either explain the difference or they're going to claim that you have some income that you didn't report and they're going to make you pay tax on the additional amount. So let's say the bank deposits are higher than what's reported on the tax return. Well, there could be some reasons for this. One, you could have put some of your own money into the business. Two, you could have borrowed some money, either from a credit line or from family and friends. Three, some family and friends could have given you some gifts, which you could have put into the account. So there could be reasons why the deposits would be higher, but you just have to explain it. Now the other thing that they look for is the expenses. And just a general rule, that the best thing that you can do to be prepared for an audit is to keep good records. If you keep records on a day-by-day -day basis or week-by-week -week basis and you don't throw things out, then if you have to go back a couple of years, you'll have all your records in place. However, if you don't keep good records and then you have to go back in time, it's going to be pretty difficult. So the best thing you can do to prepare for an audit is to start keeping the records now. Assume that the current year tax return that you file is going to be audited and proceed 
based on that. So that way you'll keep really good records, get all the information that you need now while it's fresh in your mind because if you get audited, it's most likely going to be two years down the road. And by then it's hard to remember what happened. So start by keeping good records now. Now, what type of records do we need to keep for the expenses? Okay, there are two different types of audits with regard to expenses. One has to do with expenses for a business when somebody is self-employed, and the other has to do with expenses that an employee would have, a W-2 employee. So first, let's go over the expenses that you would have for a business. Now, the, one, the first thing you would have is you're, likely to, you're very likely to have car expense. That would include car mileage. Well, what you've got to do, the first thing you got to do is you've got to keep a logbook. You've got to keep records of where you've gone and, and the purpose of the trip. But the logbook in itself isn't good enough because the IRS could look at the logbook and let's say you've got 30,000 miles and you show that all the places you've gone and they say, well, how do we know you didn't just make this up? Well, what, what you've got to do is you've got to prove that the car actually went 30,000 miles. So how could you prove that? Well, besides keeping track of the miles, the other thing you need to do is keep track of other receipts that may not have a monetary value, but there's other information that's important. Keep your oil change receipts. And if you take your car in for an annual state inspection, usually you'll get a receipt for that. Keep that receipt. Because what they do is they log the odometer reading in there. And what happens is with the odometer reading, if you, if you look at an oil change receipt, let's say from January, and then you look at another receipt at the end of the year in December, if you subtract the January odometer reading from the December odometer reading, that will show how far the, the car has gone within the year. And if it shows 30,000 or more, and you've got, let's say, 25 to 30,000 on your logbook, then you're covered because then you could show that the car really went that far. So you've really got to keep meticulous records. You've really got to keep good records. Now, another example would be uh, cell phone and internet. You've got to keep the receipts for the bills on that. And then you've also got to keep records for other expenses you might have if you bought a computer or if you've got office supplies or if you purchased equipment. Whatever it is that you're deducting on your return, you should have receipts. But once again, the receipts aren't good enough in themselves. The other thing you have to do is you have to show that these items actually got paid. So when you look at the receipt, what you want to be able to do is when you're filing away your receipts, you either want to write the check number and the date that you paid it with, or if you paid it on a credit card, then the it should show on the receipt. Or if you use the debit card, that should come out on your bank statement. But you've got to show that the receipts were paid. Because you could gather up a lot of receipts that show they were paid in cash or that, that, just, or just that you gathered up receipts, and the IRS will say, well, how do we know you didn't just get these from somebody? Or, how do we know you didn't just uh, find these somewhere and just put them in your files? You prove to us that you actually paid for the items. So in addition to having the receipts, you've got to show that you paid for them. And in the case of a car, you've got to show that the car actually went the number of miles that you're claiming it did. So that's basically what happens with a business. Now with an employee, they ask for a few extra things. They want to know, one, that the employer didn't reimburse you for the expenses that you're claiming. So just because you have the receipts for your employee business expenses, that's not good enough. You've got to show that, one, you didn't get reimbursed for them. And two, you've got to get a letter from your employer that says that the ex these expenses were necessary and ordinary in the everyday course of your business and that they were required for your job. Now, it's a good idea to get a letter from, like that from your employer on an annual basis. Because, once again, if you get audited, it's going to be two years down the road. You may not work at that place anymore. You could have been laid off or fired. That, that company could have closed down. They might not even be in business. Let's say you work for a mortgage company and in 2008. Well, that, there's a good chance that mortgage company is no longer in existence, so you can't go back and get the letter. So you've got to get a letter every year while it's fresh in everybody's mind and while everybody knows what you're talking about. Okay, 
Now, the other thing is, what can you expect to happen in the audit? In an in-person audit, usually what will happen is that they'll start by interviewing you. Sometimes there'll be one order, auditor there, and sometimes there'll be two. Sometimes they'll work in teams, and they'll ask questions, and they'll talk to each other afterwards. And sometimes it may only be one audit, auditor. But what happens is, first they'll ask you all types of questions. They'll interview you, and they'll, they'll ask you questions about what kind of business you have or what kind of job you have. And then they're going to use the answers to these questions to cross-check you to make sure that the deductions on your return make sense. So, for example, they might ask you a question, did you just put your logbook together or did you put it together two years ago while you were doing the work? And let's say you told them, well, I put my logbook together back in 2008. Well, let's say in your logbook it says that you uh, took a business trip. Let's say you live in Atlanta, Georgia, and let's say you took a business trip to Virginia. So let's say in your logbook you show that you were in Virginia from Ju uh, June 6th, let's say, to June 23rd. Well, the IRS, uh, you know, they're going to ask you if you did the logbook back in 2008, and let's say you tell them you did, but let's say you really just did it recently. Well, the IRS is going to look at that logbook, and they're going to say, okay, you, you were out on business from June 6th to June 23rd. Then they're going to look at your credit card receipts. And let's say they find you filling up at a gas station. They, they see that you purchased gas in Atlanta on June 15th. Well, they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, well, we can't accept this logbook because you said you were in Virginia from June 6th to June 23rd, and here you are buying gas in Atlanta on June 15th. Well, this stuff doesn't make sense. So you can't just make up your records. You have to make sure that everything makes sense and you, you've got to keep a good record of all the events. Now, a logbook is a pretty difficult thing for most people to keep up. I mean, everybody's busy. If you're in sales or in a business, you're probably rushing around. You're in a hurry. I mean, let's face it. We all have busy lives. But you've got to try to keep records that will allow you to recreate this information. For example, you probably have an appointment book. Well, at the end of the year, don't throw that appointment book out. Keep it for at least five years. As a matter of fact, keep all your records for at least five years. Because if you get audited two years down the road, you can pull that appointment out, see all the places that you've gone, and you could recreate the logbook. You could come up with an estimate of the miles that you think you drove for business. So these are some of the things that you could do to be prepared for an audit. And uh, I hope this information was helpful. And uh, if you like what you see, please feel free to subscribe. And uh, I'll be putting out videos, uh, some more videos shortly. And usually I'll be putting uh, like one to four videos a month out. So thank you again. And uh, I will see you in my next video.